Welcome to today's webinar, everybody. We're going to give everybody just a few minutes to get logged in, and then we're going to get started. Thank you everybody for joining us today. We're gonna to give everybody just one more minute to get in and get logged in and get settled. Hello, everybody. We're going to get started in just a few moments. We still have some participants that are joining us, and we'll get started right at the top of the hour. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. All right. Thank you again, everybody, for being here. Welcome uh, for attending our second uh, edition of the Microsoft Purview. We are excited to have Jordan Uterhagen joining us for our session. My name is Heather and I'm the Director of Member Engagement and I'll be your moderator for this session. Before we get started, we want to thank you for being a valued member of ARMA and taking advantage of your membership by joining us. From online education and industry opportunities, we encourage you to connect and gain professional resources through your membership. If you're not an ARMA member yet, I highly encourage you to visit ARMA.org and see all that ARMA has to offer. We hope to see you in October, from October 9th to 11th at ARMA InfoCon in Detroit. This event is where networking, learning, and deepening your industry knowledge takes place. We have so much good content and programming planned, but I personally am excited for the fun. We have two great events planned. Monday, we get to take a water tour of famous Detroit princess. And on Tuesday evening, we'll have the rare opportunity to have a private event at the Henry Ford Museum. If you're not familiar, it is one of the top ranked museums in the nation and is the way more than just cars. It's actually a museum of American innovation. It's truly spectacular. If you participated in ARM Infocon in the past, put your favorite memory into the chat. And for everybody's, for our FAQs, we do have uh, everybody's burning question. Will today's webinar be recorded? Yes. All professional members will receive access to the recording and slides. Please check your email for follow-up from Zoom in the next one to two business days for additional details and for access. And I do wanna take a minute to thank our speaker and our sponsor for today and the support of our ARMA and our community. We could not bring education and programming events without the support of our business partners. We hope when you are selecting services and products that you, that your business and you consider partners like Cadence Solutions who support you. And as, uh, and with that, with further ado, I'm going to turn it on over to Jordan. Jordan, welcome. Thank you very much, Heather. All right, looks like we got a, a good crew today. So I'm Jordan, I'm from Cadence. Hopefully you're here for part one, which kind of covered some of the basics of purview in a rapid fashion, went through a ton of slides last week. Um, today, we're gonna go through a little different topic. We're gonna focus on the content AI and auto classification capabilities that have been released for coming up on about a year with Microsoft 365 and a product called Syntex. Um, so we'll get started, uh, Cadence. Um, if any of you know us, we're, we're big in the purview and records management and, and governance side of things. Um, we're a Microsoft Content AI partner and also a gold partner with Microsoft. So we specialize in implementing those kinds of technologies. I'm going to start out with a poll just so we can gather some information. I'll just push this poll in a second here. Um, and I just want to know if anyone's utilized an auto classification tool before. So it's something that I know we've been some places that have used some other technologies that haven't worked so well. Uh, so it's used but not successful. We've also uh, 
uh, done a couple pilots and proof of concepts and white papers with some technology as well on auto classification uh, with some very positive results, which I'll touch on. And I did kind of tease last week as well. I'll give this poll a couple seconds here to wrap up. All right, it looks like we had most of you answer that one. I will share the results. Uh, we had 87%, 110 respondents to the say no, have not utilized an auto classification tool before. Uh, and 13% had said yes. So. A little surprising, thought there'd be a little more there. So I'm gonna just recap from last week on the three types of retention label application methods that you can use in 365. Um, first one's manual classification, of course, um, easy to deploy, very error prone, um, and lower classification rate. This is essentially letting your users pick their classification and hoping they pick it right and that they actually care about records management. I think we've all been there, and that doesn't work that well. Uh, second option is defaulted classification. We either put a default classification on a library, document library, maybe on a site, uh, or specifically on a folder built into an information architecture. So we build that structure and we teach users to file appropriately into that structure. So much higher classification rate, because essentially we're not asking the users to do anything, just place their documents, turning records into a repository um, and place them into a location that they know how to file and where to store things, similar to the file share and how they're doing things today. The third option is auto classification, and this is much harder to deploy and this is the topic for today. Um, the benefits are it's flexible to a changing information architecture. If you reorg, if they're not happy with the way things are filed, um, they do have the option of re, uh, resorting or restructuring if there's a folder classification or a folder taxonomy in place, but still maintaining the benefits of auto classifying things. And this is really beneficial for event-based retention as well. Now, one of the white papers and pilots you did with a large government organization was what percentage could we actually get that auto classification up to with a tool? And we took five document types, went through it and performed, uh, you know, the, the uh, configuration on Microsoft Syntax. And we actually got it up to 97% when we went through and finished the, the white paper. So if you do want to copy that white paper, just uh, throw your name in the chat. Uh, I believe I'll get a copy of that at the end from, from the ARMA folks, and I can send you over the white paper that kind of walks through the configuration for that, the results of that, and how that was quite successful. I'm going to just push poll number two, which is related to Syntex. I promise you this is the last poll here. So it's essentially, have you seen Microsoft Syntex before? You know, it's uh, been promoted fairly well from Microsoft, maybe not as well as Copilot, which is definitely the flavor of their AI marketing engine right now. A couple more answering, we'll just get this around 120 and we'll end that one there. So uh, results here, we have almost 70% haven't seen it before, but 30% have, which does impress me. We were dem demonstrating syntax probably six months ago and even at a conference and people would walk up to the booth and say, what's that thing? What's syntax over there? So you're gonna see a lot more of it today. <clears throat> so kind of the context for today, uh, I'm gonna go through, not nowhere near as many slides as last week. We're gonna go through uh, 15 or so slides on syntax. And then I'm gonna break off into the demonstration from last week, love the little, Icons popping up, mocking me for last week. That's great. Um, we'll go through the uh, components of Syntex, just so you kind of know where Microsoft's going with the branding. They are multi-branding Syntex, kind of like they did with Viva, where they have different products coming out of the same kind of pillar. Uh, so I just want to clear up the, the capabilities through terminology you're going to see from Microsoft. And then I'm going to actually go and show specific scenarios in accounts payable and human resources where you can actually use this technology to do auto classification, metadata extraction, and then of course put retention labels on that because you know what your content is. Um, so the capabilities for Microsoft, they're gonna talk about these three kind of sub pillars, enhancing your content, understanding and assembling it, connecting it, so discover and reuse of it, and then managing it, so analyze and protect. And of course, the folks on the line today, you guys are all about protection um, through governance. The enhanced side and the understanding side um, or the assemble side really turn into the ability to do things that we've been doing for a really long time, but maybe not in the way they have been. So if you want to actually go and 
um, do document processing. So assemble content. I want to send out a bunch of utility bills. I want to send out the same thing. We used to do this with mail merges. Now I can actually utilize templates inside of the 365 ecosystem, push this out through syntax and put things out for potentially signature. I want to put out a, a MSA agreement to a bunch of bidders that are bidding on a project. I want to put out a non-disclosure agreement. I'd like to put out a letter stating that, you know, this is happening with my municipality, with my organization and all staff thing they need to sign. All that can be done now with Syntex essentially being this quote unquote content AI, um, content assembly tool. So where this really takes the industry and what we're seeing a trend in is it's further consolidation. If organizations previously had document assembly tools, um, they are now reconsidering if that's the tool for the future or if they should simply just add another piece to the M365 uh, ecosystem they're licensed for and use something within the ecosystem. That creates a couple benefits on the governance side. One is the information stays within the tenant. So you're no longer moving that off to a, a secondary platform to go and distribute that information, those letters, those documents that you may be uh, doing on mass. Um, it also allows you to translate content into a number of different languages natively within SharePoint as well. So you can actually go in and say, I want this document to be in French, I want this document to be in Spanish, and it will flip it on the fly into the new language. So you can actually see there's uh, a number of different video transcription uh, capabilities, um, as well as language capabilities coming with syntax as well. So including OCRing, and OCRing is a big one, right? We get those uh, users or folks that put the document in the system. It happens to be a scanned image that turns into a PDF and we can't get that content searchable. So we can't use it in any discovery. Uh, and we start to struggle with just finding things because it was not OCR going. So that's the enhanced pillar that Microsoft's working on. The connect side of things is bringing this into search. Um, so discovering and reusing that content and one announcement that we'll be rolling out second half of this year, so before you know, the end of the year here is e-signature from Microsoft. And that will be labeled with Syntex on the front of it. So it's going to be Microsoft Syntex e-signature. So it's in private preview right now uh, with uh, the partner and some of the customer community. And it's going to go into uh, general availability second half of this year is what they've been uh, communicated. So we're already through essentially quarter three. So it's got to be out in the next couple months. Um, the e-signature piece under Syntex, we're not going to show that today, but we're pretty excited to get into that because it's again going to keep that content within the tenant. We may use Adobe Sign or DocuSign and that content has to leave your protected platform to go out to a secondary platform for signature. And that can be a problem if you're looking at doing sensitive content, disposition and retention on that. When it goes out to I know DocuSign, I have to contact them and start to purge your content uh, based on the cycle. So you lose a bit of control there with the tools you've built inside of potentially purview uh, to go through and do the retention. So a couple other things they're releasing in the Connect side of things is they do have solution accelerators for contract management and accounts payable. I'm going to show off one of those today on the accounts payable side of things. And then the ability to just connect your essential uh, discover tool, which can do the capture, the OCRing and everything with the broader ecosystem, Power Automate, the Power Platform, if you're using Azure AI Builder, um, those are components that you're able to connect quite easily. So uh, call it single throat to choke. If it doesn't work, it's a Microsoft product in the mix. You're not going out to a third party and having that uh, conversation where usually two vendors point at each other and blame each other and nothing gets resolved. Being on that, uh, both sides of that fence before. The management side they're releasing as well. So they're doing uh, a couple other sub products called Syntex Backup and Syntex Archiving. Um, if you're a very mature organization and you're starting to fill SharePoint with a ton of content uh, and you're not really uh, your, your cost model is expanding beyond the value of that content. You may want to look at some, one of these backup tools. So there's other tools out on the market, of course, like Veeam. Uh, Microsoft's releasing a backup tool through Syntex and an archiving tool through Syntex. They're working on the um, connectivity pieces with Purview to make sure which takes precedence, the retention labels or the archiving and the backup. The archivists on here are going to be screaming at me right now for using the word archiving, Microsoft's term, not mine. Um, but that is a way of moving things to lower cost storage. So something to keep in mind. The other benefit of this in the future that we're seeing is there's no throttling. So the throttling 
is a big problem with third-party products and going into 365. And what that means is they limit the amount of data you can move in or out of the platform. If you're backing up, it's out. If you're migrating in, of course, it's, it's uploading. And those are things that are essentially non-negotiable in terms of having that content uh, or those tools throttled by Microsoft. Of course, if it's a first-party tool, they trust it more and it's not throttled. So keep that in mind if you are doing due diligence on some of these other more technical or IT um, components that may be beneficial to, to take a look into this. So I wanted to at least cover the broader syntax side of things because the branding confusion or the multi-branding is going to be more and more relevant here, including when they release Signature shortly. Um, a couple of common scenarios. So the one we're going to cover today is information classification and retention. So can we automatically capture and classify um, information to more easily find it, of course. So can we put a document in there? Can it identify what it is? If it can identify what it is, that's great. We can put a retention label on it. Maybe we can apply a sensitivity label based on some content or in combination with the retention label and have the ability to um, move that into a different document library for security, storage, convenience, whatever it may be. But it really gives us the ability because of capture to do that. The easiest comparison in this pillar would be something like a Cofax, a Captiva, uh, Input Excel used to be a product name. OpenText has uh, Capture Center uh, and Intelligent Capture. So those products have been around in the capture space for decades. Um, and this is essentially Microsoft's release of their own version of that, but embedded in the ecosystem. Second component is financial data management. So the two departments we get called upon all the time to go in and automate are accounts payable and HR. And specifically HR, it's usually onboarding. So those heavy workflow, repeatable processes uh, that require extraction, require workflow, require sensitive storage of documents and records, um, and obviously something organized. It works really well in the physical file rooms because everything at its place, you go digital and it can turn into a mess fairly quickly. So I'm gonna show off today the financial side of things. We're gonna go through and extract content out of an invoice um, and show you how we can extract the data out of the invoice, the line items out of the invoice. And then of course we can send that off for processing, whether that's an auto pay or some kind of formal approval process. So that's on the financial side. You can essentially mimic that on the ordering side. If you're receiving orders and you wanna go extract things, you know, upload um, or send purchase orders, extract the information out of that, um, do those kinds of um, automated order processing sites uh, of, of your business, that's possible as well. In terms of the technology, so I started as a technologist and then got involved in records and now I'm kind of a hybrid in between both. So I always like to cover this for any folks on the line. And if this is too deep, just comment in the Q&A and I'll, I'll tone it down next time because I don't want to get into too much, but I do want to educate as a part of these sessions. Um, so we have the content ingestion side of things. Where are we importing content from? So again, Teams, Outlook, uh, SharePoint, if you're using Yammer, if we're bringing things in through a migration, they can come from a file share, another system, and we can run them through a number of different components. We've done projects where we run them through Capture as soon as they hit like a, a temporary SharePoint doc library. So we want to run all the content through Capture that we're migrating and then migrate it further into SharePoint. So an example would be, um, I take a messy share drive. We know it's for HR. We bring all that stuff into an auto migration library. We've trained the model to say there's 70 document types in here that we know are pertain to human resources. We want to identify those 70 document types. And then upon identifying those, we want to file those appropriately. So, you know, hey, we have Jordan's resume that goes in. Uterhagen, comma, Jordan, doc set, and goes in a subfolder. Uh, we have another thing, Jordan's benefits agreement, his, you know, maybe if his share options or any of those sensitive things, they go in different subfolders where there's different security. And what this actually lets us do is take the heavy lifting away from the users and put it on the backs of the system. So we train the model to be intelligent, and then we can perform the migration and that nasty activity of content cleanup on the file share usually and let the system do that in SharePoint Online, the syntax, as opposed to begging your users to do it so you can move forward with your project. So it is one way we're starting to utilize this tool and why we've been pretty excited here at Cadence about getting our hands on syntax. The next piece of things is the understanding and the processing of what comes in. So can we put this into an information architecture? What do we do with standard forms? So if we have a standard form, maybe we wanna always extract metadata off the form we want to uh, push this into a, a Power Automate flow. 
so we can move this across the organization, put it into a team's approval, um, and really just look at that metadata and content compliance just to highlight that here. So if we wanna have that auto extraction metadata and that makes us compliant with either a retention schedule or some kind of regulation we have to adhere to, um, that's a benefit as well. You don't have to go and you know procure another tool and integrate it with SharePoint Online if that's your system of choice. Um, you're able to just bolt on another product to it. Uh, third, of course, we're gonna put this thing to work. So the different components I covered previously is content assembly, are we using the extracted metadata to generate some kind of business document? So maybe we're doing renewals on contracts. Maybe we're doing uh, offer letters where we're extracting things from workflow that, you know, we're going to hire Jordan. He wants this wage, this position, this start date, and we're going to send him a standard offer letter. Boom, right out of the SharePoint uh, and Power Automate side of things with Syntax. Um, we want a search experience. So the ability to find uh, the content because it's OCR, um, again, that goes down the line and a number of different benefits. Users are happier, they can find something. Uh, the security and compliance folks are happy because they can actually go through e-discovery if there's freedom of information or public records requests. That's something that uh, you can adhere to now without really, again, needing to procure another tool. Um, sidebar on that, if you're going to ARM at Infocon, my session on the Tuesday will be on e-discovery. Um, so that's something that we're gonna be focusing on uh, in kind of a deep dive session during that. <clears throat> For security and compliance, of course, if we can go through numbers one and two here, we can capture, we can extract metadata, boom, we can be compliant. We can attach those retention labels. Uh, we can place content in secured areas. We can look at sensitivity labels if we're not using the uh, DLP um, and start to place all those little you know, flags or components on top of the documents and records to make it more uh, secure and of course, make us more compliant with that without again, needing to go and get a, another tool. The technical side of things, if you want to get really technical, um, you can use the graph connectors uh, and the graph API to get into uh, the AI side of things here with Syntax to perform different functions. So they have a, you know, an open API and quite a lot of extensive documentation on there to go through and perform those additional functions. Just in terms of understanding how you teach the machine. So I wanna just cover this cause I'm gonna show it working. We're not gonna go through and set up the training but we'll show the, the execution of this. So um, you wanna understand your content of course and create the model. When you add sample files, um, we will add files to begin the training process. The minimum is five. We like to see around 20 put in there um, and you can also feed it negative samples. So let's use an example of an invoice. So these 20 things are invoices, different formats. You're gonna get invoices from QuickBooks and SAP and Sage, and your organization is going to receive all different formats invoices. And then you can feed it things that aren't invoices. So let's feed it a purchase order, a goods receipt, things that may come in the same inbound email. We say, look, these aren't invoices. These are other documents, and we don't want them to be included in this model, or we don't want it to be classified as an invoice. As we go through and classify the files and train it, we identify the unique characteristics of the document for that model so it can recognize it. So we wanna go through and make sure that an invoice, we want an invoice number, we want line items, we want totals, we wanna to see a dollar sign. Uh, we wanna make sure that this isn't some uh, other kind of document that we are uh, false positively moving through the classification. We wanna train the extraction process. So what do we wanna extract? What rules do we wanna put on that? Um, and what do we need to capture for metadata? So again, the invoice example. PO number, vendor name, line items. Are we taking the quantity on the line items? Are we doing a three-way match with the invoice that comes in? That means we're comparing the invoice against the pur purchase order, against the goods receipt. A lot of organizations do that three-way match and then auto pay the invoice. So no approval required. And then where do we actually want to apply this model? So which libraries, which doc libraries does this model get applied to? So in any tool, not just syntax, when you go through and you're trying to train the machine, all the work is done in steps one, one and two. We're classifying it, we're adding samples, we're training, we're training, we're training until we're hitting a point where we're comfortable to release that out to a doc library and start to reap the benefit of that. There's a couple different ways to go through and actually perform uh, the different ways of training things, training the model. So we can go through the teaching method. This is unstructured documents. So this could be a letter. So we go through a letter, we wanna teach the model how to understand text, classify it and extract it from there. So we have a number of different uh, document formats that can go through with this. 
Um, and you can do it in most languages as well. We can do the layout method. This is something more specific like an invoice. Uh, to structure a document, we can train it by marking the location so you can kind of draw around. Mark the locations and you can extract the content. You can do that on PDFs, PNGs, and JPEGs. It works really well in accounts payable because, well, everything comes in as a PDF if they want to get paid and do it in 70 plus languages. And then there's the free form selection. So you can train a model by selecting anywhere in a file. So if we're just going through and it's you know, maybe some scans that are, we always kind of had something on the right side and it never was really the top right, but somewhere around there, we want to go through and train it. So true, like, teaching method for the machine to circle those PDFs and images to make sure we're training it as accurately as we can. And that's only available in English. So the three different methods there. The goal of course, going through this is to improve the precision and the consistency around managing that metadata and essentially creating a central hub so we can go through and perform this and then go through and reap the benefits of discovery, the processing and the governance on this. Now, the one thing that I think a lot of organizations don't consider when they look at something like this, and full disclaimer, we don't get paid to sell Syntex, we're just excited about it, um, is if you stop using Syntex, and I'll just back up to this slide, the license is consumed per page. So if you set up this model, let's say you use it for a migration project because you don't want to do cleanup, you incur the cost, of the per page, so it's a consumption transactional license. So I put pages in, I get a, a bill at the end of the month. Um, I stop using it, I don't pay anything. The ability to essentially throttle or stop usage of the platform, but retain all of the intelligence and the essential intellectual property of your content inside of it, gives you a lot of downstream benefit. I can essentially quote unquote, turn this on, process a bunch of stuff, turn it off by not feeding it any information, wait six months, onboard my next department, go through my next accounts payable project, whatever it may be, onboard or enable the system again and go through and perform the function again and then incur the cost again. So it doesn't really give you a capitalized cost where you're going to executives and going through and uh, uh, asking for a bunch of dollars on a capital budget. You may be able to do this on more of an operational side of things. I see there's a question there. We're gonna hold those just till the end. We'll open up the QA. If you wanna pop them in the Q&A box, we can obviously jump back to a component here. So I'm gonna jump into the demo side of things. I'll just break off of the deck here for a second. We will bring up this. Grab a few documents here. Excellent. So the first example here, we're going to go with the Contoso theme from Microsoft. Uh, maybe if Heather or Megan there can give me a thumbs up that the screen share is working. Uh, anybody else on the line and the Zoom is looking okay. Um, the first example we're going to use here is going through the HR side of things. All right. Thank you for the folks giving me the thumbs up. Um, the HR side of things. So essentially what this is, this is a, a, a hub. Um, inside of the hub, we have two sites, HR, accounting, and then the content center is really what comes from Microsoft for training the libraries and really going through syntax. And I'm going to cover all three of these. So you see the machine working, and then we'll go into a few components on the machine as well. So on the HR side of things, we have this employee benefits area. And as we upload content in here, we want it to be automatically recognized. So I'm just going to go grab two documents, drag and drop them here. You see it upload quickly, and it's going to take about a minute or so to go through and recognize the provider. Attach a retention label. Don't crucify me for you know general correspondence as a label, and give us a classification date, and we'll let this thing spin for a few seconds. While that's going, just in the essence of time, I'm just going to jump over to accounting. We're just going to do the same thing with invoices quickly. I'm going to grab three invoices and drop these in. We'll jump back to HR. While it's running, we're just going to show you the content of this. So this is a benefits change notice. We have a few different components in here. We have the company we're trying to extract, the insurance provider. We have a date in here. We have a general letter. 
you know, fairly graphical. I found with a lot of capture tools, the more stuff you have in the top half of the first page that's graphical, they can tend to struggle because they try to process these things, especially when you have things like words over top of a graphic. So those layers can create you know, some problematic capture side of things. So kind of an FYI on that. Um, what we're looking to gather out of this is essentially extract the provider, SV Organics and the general correspondence. So we'll just give this a few moments to run. Give our accounting side a peek as well. I got to give live demos. So either, you know, uh, boom or bust on these ones when you, when you give them. And I'll also say this just to maybe uh, uh, talk to, uh, if you're talking to another vendor, make sure they give you a live demo. If they're, if they're not giving you a live demo, uh, you could have something that's cooked and you don't want that coming into uh, a sales engagement when they're trying to convince you of something, being on the, the customer side of that one. All right, so one more refresh here and we have these in here. So uh, I'm on Mountain Time here, uh, Systems on Pacific. So it's automatically extracted the best for your organics company, attach a retention label and put that on here. So what that actually is grabbing swap screens is this component as metadata in the document and putting that in the metadata field. So if you were doing this on mass, there's a number of different things we can do now. One, we can say that, hey, whoa, we're in litigation with Best for Your Organics company, bang, legal hold, that has to go on hold, moves to a separate area, ends up in a collection, goes off to outside counsel. Two, we can go down the retention path, the happy path, we know this is good content. We're going to move this into a different area. We're going to tag it with our appropriate retention label. Let Purview do its thing when the time is right. So fairly simple demonstration. Uh, you know, obviously the, the magic is in the setup of this and, and that. To show you it's working effectively, I'll open the second letter, which has cadence in it. So cadence is tagged here as a metadata field as well. Just gonna move the zoom thing out of the way. We're able to extract all that information straight out and even apply a sensitivity label right off the top. So pretty simple example in the HR side of things. Now, if we were bringing these in for an individual, so if, let's say this was Jordan's benefits contract change letter and Jordan, we're changing your benefit provider from Caden Solutions to Best for Your Organics. Uh, we can automatically go file this potentially in Jordan's personnel file that maybe we've made him acknowledge that this change is happening via an e-signature and then take this signed copy, move it into a filing location under his digital personnel file. So lots of different options there. On the accounting side of things, we have the invoices doc library. And in the invoices doc library, we have three invoices. So I'll open up the first couple here. And all pretty similar, um, pretty plain Jane invoices here. Uh, a couple line items. Yep, this is invoice one, invoice two, and invoice three. And we're looking to differentiate the capture of the vendor at the top. Paul's Jiu Jitsu, University of Iowa. Pulse Plumbing, and you can kind of see that this one doesn't have the big fancy header that the others do. So as these go into capture, you saw it run in about a minute, you can see it start to extract the different components here. So we have the invoice number, the PO number, A0, A0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the total due, and then line item info, which I'll show in a second. So we're actually able to go through and capture all of this relevant information. Actually capture the pound sign, number sign, um, captured University of Iowa, went through, it actually extracted these line items. I don't need to remember book binders, uh, asset-free boxes and library cards, and it captured the PO number as well. So it went through into more of a structured document and captured this information, including the total due. As we capture this info, it differentiates between different invoices, nothing really additional to, to comment on there. Um, we can go in and view the table information on this. So we can actually go through and do line item extraction. Now, as a governance person, you're probably like, yeah, that, that's not really my department. I'm not that excited about it. But what this actually provides you when you go to get potentially funded for a governance project is this solves the business problem of 
we're keyboarding in everything. Usually these line items are keyed in by somebody and some organizations we've worked with have teams of 25 to 50 people just keying this information in. And you can say we have this really uh, great IM tool that we can use to extract that information for you and uh, alleviate the you know, labor intensive activity of keying in all that data. After you have this, of course, your main goal is governance, retention, and you know, potentially automation in there as well. Um, you can tag on your, your records management requirements to the back half of potentially a project like this. So it gives you a lot of capabilities in terms of um, finding an ally in the organization if you're, if you're looking to do a, an IM project and also solving a business problem up front with the technology that can actually help you do other things like content cleanup or uh, classification and metadata extraction. So the fact you can go and pull out line items straight off of an invoice and just to show you once more, if you wanna split screen this or as close as we can, we're pulling out those unit prices, 375, 400, 600 the description and the quantities. All this comes out based on the library that's been trained or the model that's been trained and applied to the library. So we've taken this further in terms of approvals and walking through validation of this. So you can put it in front of somebody to say, yes, that looks good and validate that. So instead of them keying 100%, they may key the five to 10% that, that don't match when the, the system goes and processes it. There's a lot of different potential there. So same thing with invoice number two, um, goes through, grabs the two line items coming out of it. Got the two line items. Even grabs the comma, pretty impressive. Uh, units, pricing, everything comes out. So a lot of different ways to utilize this tech. I'm gonna just jump into the content center side of things and kind of show some of the setup of the models. And if you're looking to get into this and you're kind of one of the, the do-it-yourselfer types, this is where you really wanna be. Um, the content center, you can go in and simply create a model. And inside of the model side of things, you'll see those three different methods I, I mentioned previously, teaching, freeform, and layout. And we'll just grab the layout method. And this is essentially one of the ones that, you know, supports PDFs, PNGs, and JPEGs. Um, and you can go through and essentially train the model, uh, select the model, and then train the model based on this. Choose the information you extract. Add a collection of documents, those samples you want, go through and train it for the extraction and apply it to a library. So pretty powerful. I'll just go right back in and do one more. So we can look at potentially the teaching method. And this is something we used on the first example I gave with the benefits letter from HR. Supported file type, as you noticed, was a word type. Um, a bunch of different document types, over 22 file types. Um, where you can go through and say, I need to extract this out of these locations. We actually had a project we did for a, an energy company that had land lease agreements from as old as the 1940s, where they would you know, write these out on a piece of paper and then file it away in a physical file room, stayed there for 70 years. And they actually went through and used technology like this to extract the leasee and the leasor out of that agreement so they could go and track down who they need to talk to if they were going to go you know, uh, dig up a pipeline on that uh, right of way and notify people that uh, they were coming. It was quite an interesting project, but it used more of this uh, teaching method of you need to extract between these words or these things so we can, um, or these areas, so we can uh, extract that metadata and proceed in some kind of capacity. You can upload your training files into a different area. We have um, our training files here, different copies, of course, um, and then go through and essentially deploy this to the different libraries. As you can see, we have the unstructured uh, benefits, unstructured document processing for our benefits, and then the structured document processing for the invoices side of things. Um, if you want to import a sample, you can do that and it'll import you a sample as well. So all different ways to kind of get you kick-started if you're looking at diving into this stuff. So one other side of this is they do have pre-built models. So they have contracts models built in, Invoice processing and receipt processing are all built in to the offering that Syntex brings without needing to, um, I guess, build or train that model and incur the cost, whether that's time or money, to build out that model. I'm going to jump back into the slide deck quickly here, and then we'll open it up for Q&A in a few seconds as well. 
So just to kind of wrap up a few, you know, uh, networking events, we're going to be at the Arma Infocon conference. Um, we're hosting a happy hour event at a place called The Vault. Looks pretty cool, very relevant to records, of course. So if you got your phone out there, um, hit that QR code and uh, fill out a form and we'd love to, to meet you and uh, you know, have a beverage with you at the vault. <clears throat> uh, we also offer purview training. Uh, just wrapped up a course uh, out in the beautiful Sunshine Coast in British Columbia, Canada, um, where we go through and do four half days of training and walk you through hands-on training with purview. It makes it a little more impactful when you do it hands-on as opposed to lecture style. Um, webinars are great for you know getting your uh, you know, your appetite wet a little bit, but we want to get a little deeper into things. If you're looking to get into purview training, uh, we do offer that as well and have a great team here and some great recommendations from folks. So thank you for attending today. By no means, don't go anywhere yet. We're going to ask uh, or go through the Q&A. Um, but just to wrap up, you're going to receive the email from Arma on the recording. Um, you're going to receive the slides. I'll send those out as well from my side of things uh, to Arma and they can circulate those. The recordings actually go on the Arma YouTube channel. So they're in the midst of changing over their learning management system. So if you are looking for it quickly, it was there within 24 hours last time. Um, the third part of the session, we're going to focus back into purview, kind of the uh, disposition side of uh, workflows with purview. Uh, released an article yesterday on some of the permission models that uh, get put into that as well. So that's October 24th, a couple of weeks after the conference for those folks attending. Um, if you're looking to learn more, we do have uh, a really informative newsletter that goes out. Um, I promise you it's not salesy. It talks about announcements from Microsoft, uh, upcoming events, webinars. It talks and circulates the recordings for sessions like this. Uh, so it's something you can uh, subscribe to. It goes out once a month, not too often, but enough that the industry changes enough. Um, and if you want to connect with me, uh, here's my contact details. So shoot me an email, uh, drop a uh, your contact info in chat or a one-on-one -on -one message. Uh, happy to have a conversation. I'm all over LinkedIn as well for that. So um, let's turn it over to questions. I don't know if Heather's going to broker those or I'm going rogue on that. But. Hey, we can go either way. There are uh, a few that are in here. So we can start at the top. The first one that came in, uh, is there a difference between tenant and M365 environment? No, just terminology from my side of things. So um, I'll maybe clarify that. If you're looking to play with technology uh, and you don't want to risk oopsing a configuration on your production tenant, you can get a development tenant or environment from Microsoft. So you just have to fill out a form and they'll deploy one for you with about 25 users. Um, so you can go through and um, I guess tweak things and, and configure things without impacting that. It's really good to learn purview that way as well. Um, we do that on our demo environments. They're all test environments. We do that with our clients when we're doing an implementation. We get a dev environment provisioned. Um, but a tenant, an environment, same thing. Probably just me uh, speaking another turn on that. Great. Christopher is asking, is this replacing or improving on Power Apps AI Builder for document data capture? I will say improving. Take that as an opinion. Uh, not replacing yet but there has been some market confusion on when to use one versus when to use the other. My personal take on Syntex is they're taking the best of what they have available in their technology today and bundling it into a product that's much easier to use and a cost model that's much easier to understand. The AI builder side of things was a credit-based thing and it, it always kind of confused customers on how many credits do I need to do the thing I'm trying to do um, as opposed to a per page processing license. Great. Um, we do have a question about what are some common issues that emerge from organizations adopting purview? <clears throat> common user errors, setup, et cetera. Common issues. Um, if we're talking in terms of if you're looking to onboard an organization into purview, it's the ability to convince users to one, participate in the project is one. So the change management side. Um, and I'd say with Purview, it's a little flatter structure than the traditional records management system. So a lot of them, you get to see the full hierarchy when you build out your retention schedule. So um, if you have that, you know, old example of administration and then admin general 0, 0100 and admin budgets is 0, 0200, whatever it may be, you don't actually see it as a hierarchy. So that can kind of cause one of my long-term records uh, friends and clients 
called me up and she goes, where's the hierarchy here? And I'm like, well, you're moving from a different system, which was open text and they have a nice hierarchy in there, but purview doesn't. So on the pure record side of things, I'd say that's one of the common head scratchers. Um, the other side of things I'd say like common user errors or setup, I'd say it's the relationship with IT because IT really has the keys to that system as opposed to when you would deploy a different kind of record system or records has the administration access right away. So you have to play nice with IT and be given the access to do things like discovery and compliance manager roles so you can actually go through and perform your configuration. So I'd say that's more of a, a common issue, maybe not a user error. From a general rambling answer to that, Users shouldn't be impacted by purview. They should just be, in my opinion, guided to where to save their content. And then purview should take over once the content's there. Uh, I'm gonna kind of combine two questions here. Is Microsoft Syntax part of your M365 subscription or is it an add-on? And another question asking, is Syntax included in the E5 license or is there an extra cost? So it is an add-on, it is not included in E5. Its cost model is five cents per page currently, uh, per page processed. Uh, so when you're putting content in there, be aware of that. Um, and I believe you can do a 30 day trial by just adding it to your cart through the uh, admin side of things on 365. Likely IT would have to perform that activity for you. Uh, some, uh, Hannah's asking, where do you find the list of 22 types of document formats for the teach method? I will dig up that list and I will add it to the slide, Hannah. So I will take that as a takeaway on my end. Okay. Wonderful, add that. And we'll make sure everybody gets that. Uh, Beth is asking, can you expand on that licensing paying for use? How do I realistically budget for this license if it is per paid? Uh, is it just something that you can, that you pay or be in, invoiced as you go? So it's invoiced as you go, you don't have to prepay for the license. Um, I would just be cautious with the volume you feed it if your budget, if you're trying to be careful with your budget. So what we've done in the past when we're onboarding an organization into syntax is we will take one content type that we understand very well. So I'll pick on invoices because that's been the theme. We know that our average page length on our invoices is three. We know we do 5,000 a month. We're gonna do 15,000 pages at five cents, let's budget for that for the first month, run it through and see how the system reacts and meets our expectations. Okay, uh, and also does the site, uh, and then it's Teams versus communication or permissions, internet versus department site, on the site matter when running Syntex on it? Can you go through that once more, Heather? Yeah, so it's asking, if she's asking, does the site teams versus communication or permissions, the internet versus department site on the site matter when running syntax on it? I don't believe so, the site type. Um, I'll have to check on the permission side of things. I believe it's, it's not running as an individual user. So permissions are more agnostic as you're opting in the doc library. Um, but if uh, they want to send that question over one-on-one. -on -one. I'll make sure I get that answered. If you just shoot me an email, if you can see it on the screen there. Yeah. Uh, uh, asking if you had a doc that contained your company's name as the sender and mentioned uh, the provider and the mentioned provider company, how does it determine to pick up the provider company name? Let me read that one again. If you had a doc that contained your company name, the sender, so let's say Acme Corporation, yep. and the mentioned provider company, how does it determine to pick up the provided company name? So that is done through the free form text model. So if it's more of a structured document, we want to train it to pick up the text after it sees other text. So if we go with the leasee and the leasor example I gave with the energy company, we knew that the word between this agreement is between Jordan and this other person. Between was our key in word where we would start to look for text around that. So we could key in on a common phrase and then look on either side of it to extract text or extract text. Wonderful. Uh, Janice is asking, asking how well does syntax slash 
OCR recognize handwritten text or numbers? That's always the kicker, hey, the handwriting. So I've always made the kind of joke, like it's not gonna recognize your doctor's handwriting. Um, we haven't went through and actually tried it with handwriting because it's, it's such a limited use case. But uh, if it's the Janice I'm thinking of, Janice, uh, send me an email. Uh, and uh, if you have an example, um, we'll, we'll give it a shot and, and just give you the results back in one of our test environments because we'd like to try it. Okay. Going back to uh, the licensing per page, is that charging per page used in order to train the model or is it per page for auto classifying documents in the library? It's definitely per page consumed. On the training side, I don't actually know. I'll have to check on that because our, our licenses as a partner are a little different. We don't incur a cost. So I will take that one away as well. Uh, so someone is asking if you can send a link to the newsletter that you referenced. Um, and if you want to include that in your slides, we can definitely uh, send that out afterwards. Well, that is right here. This will be a PDF and you'll be able to click the link. I think the QR code works as well. Okay. Uh, we have someone asking, can you show again how you applied the sensitivity level? Oh, that was a bit of a cheat in this one because it was there, but I'll, I'll go in there and, and show it. wasn't the intent of the, the presentation, but it did pop up. So we go over to the details pane, the little information icon. And then you have sensitivity here. And these are all ones that you want to define. So I know in government, sometimes it's protected ABC. Um, if we want to flip this to confidential, we can either do that through a tool or manually. Really, really impressive feature. I'll say that like from a governance record side, this was my jaw dropping moment when you could auto identify. So I'm gonna ramble on this for a second right now. So um, what you can do with sensitivity labels is we let this thing open up and Word Online always kind of butchers nice formatting if you've used it before. Um, you can have this identify so Canadian here, but that's our version of a social security number. If you put this in a document, you can have the system automatically identify that this is a social security or social insurance number, and it will automatically give you a tooltip across the top and flag it with a sensitivity label. So this gives you a whole nother way of restricting content without even needing to go through a tool for really specific pattern recognition, credit cards, passport numbers, um, SIN numbers, social security numbers can all be done this way. And this is a very, very quick setup. Wonderful. Uh, and we do have Tyler asking, does Cadence Solutions recommend using Microsoft Purviews for e-discovery communication tool? If so, do you have any information on the limits of the tool? And he does go into a little bit more of his experience. So yes, I'd like to clarify communication around that. So most of the e-discovery is uh, collect. So let's do our search. What are we searching? There's the term called custodians. So we're actually searching mailboxes of people. Uh, we're searching OneDrive and we're searching SharePoint. We collect those documents as in Purview collects them, puts them through a review set. Somebody goes through, you know, in the paper world, they'd flip through them and say, yes, yes, no, um, performs any necessary redactions. And then you can do an export. So for doing all that, for exporting, the communication to the outside on the export would be where I'd ask what they're doing today. Is it a public sector organization with a records request where they're divulging this in a zip file? Are they engaging outside counsel where it's a little more complicated? Um, the, the mechanism there can be, I guess is the crux of that question, which I, I don't have any context for, but the e-discovery side of it, the beauty of what I like and purview for e-discovery is it goes in the mailbox, it goes in OneDrive and it goes in SharePoint. So it, it grabs everything. You don't have to buy separate tools for separate components like or license it separately it's all included in e5 and even e3 there's a good chunk of it in there okay. um we have someone asking do you support or do you have support on publishing retention labels of support on publishing retention labels uh yes we if we're asking if we can help yes 
Um, if you have published your retention label, I believe they can take up to a week to go through. I haven't seen it take that long myself. Usually it's done within 24 hours. Um, but we can assist there, or if you uh, need other support, yeah, shoot me an email and we'll, we'll see how we can help. Do you have any use cases where you have set up syntax? Uh, yep, yeah, that's the white paper. I think I saw that in the Q&A that a few people wanted that, so. Yeah, so and we can that. also include that with our uh, send to Jordan if you wanna. I'll send that over as well. A lot, of, a lot of people have been asking for that, so. I got a lot of homework out of this session. You got a lot the of last homework. One, so. um, and there's still a couple more uh, questions here. If you have any automatically updating metadata using either flows or default column values, Will or will or can purview connect to use to these to use them for additional context when classifying? So yes, we've done that. We've actually used that to do case closure of records. So connected to updating metadata fields. I use a contract example. The end date can move on a contract. Contractor's late. Project gets extended, um, and then utilizing that field on the purview side of things to perform the calculation for destruction a destruction timeline. Uh, and we do have a question here is uh, Microsoft syntax available in the GCC tenant? I believe it's in GCC. I'd have to double check. It's It's been out close to a year here. Okay. Um, I think. Oh, we have one more came in. Uh, okay, so for those of us with an IT department that does not want to switch to Microsoft Records Management because of the permissions, have you heard of any Microsoft talk of making purview more out of the box records management that <coughs> wouldn't have the permissions issue? I need some context on the permission side of things. Um, but out of the box has been our preferred method of deploying purview. I know there's add-ons specifically app point and record point that are pretty prominent in the industry. Um, they do provide some additional benefit, but in all honesty, you're, you're hedging your bet on, will Microsoft release the functionality that the third party has in the time required for you to onboard your departments? So they're constantly adding more to it. Um, two, three years ago, purview out of the box, not quite ready. Now the, the piece that we were really excited about is can we do case closure of records out of the box? Once we can do that, we know that's one of the harder record scenarios to obtain. We deviated pretty hard as a company into just going out of the box with purview. Not every time, but most times. But I'd like more info on the permission uh, restriction or perceived restriction the individual's having. Wonderful. Um, in our last question, what is what are some best uses for purview in an organization that heavily uses and pardon me for not knowing the per correct pronunciation of this it's s a a s applications SAS applications yeah SAS? okay applications where the official records the retention rules were are created and kept so that's a trickier one so i did just mention the the third party side of things um Let's say you're using success factors or for HR systems, or you're using an asset management system that's hosted and the content does not reside in the M365 tenant or environment. Um, you, you essentially have two options to go and grab the records out of that system. One is you procure a third party uh, tool that connects into that system. So something like Record Point and Record Point would monitor that system and then perform the disposition via purview when the time's right for the asset record that's ready to go through the destruction cycle or the review cycle. Um, the other option is you build your own version of that to go connect in, but Purview does not connect out to all these SaaS systems. Um, there's very few it goes to. So right now it goes to like Bloomberg Terminals one, offers me discovery components. And I think Slack was on board or coming on board as well. Okay. To the individual that asked the GCC question for syntax, as of um, March earlier this year, it was not in GCC yet. So I'd have to do some digging on if it's moved forward since then. 
Wonderful. And we had one last question come in. Does syntax only recognize words or can it recognize and identify pictures? So it can identify pictures and it can OCR the, the text in the image as well. Okay. I think we've got most everything. Thank you, Jordan, for being here. Thank you very uh, much. Looks like a lot of a lot of them stuck around till the end. So great appreciate it. And, uh, answered here, and thank you everybody for uh, sticking around. And if uh, we see you at Infocon, love to interact and uh, come say hi. And otherwise, we will see you October twenty fourth for part three. Have a great day, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.